Hey, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was, thanks. That was a real encouragement. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Brian. If I don't know you, I'm the lead pastor here at uh, Grace City. And so thanks for making it out uh, today. And so church in Boston is one of those things where um, uh, every Sunday I'm like, church in Boston, you, you, it, it's one of those things where like you, you got to want it. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're like either train or traffic or parking or whatever, right? It's like I work, um, you're like, I, you know, I work all week, I, I do school all week or whatever, and you're, you're up and going in the morning. And then you're, the weekends, you know, you're like, I want to sleep in on Saturday. And, and so well, I want to sleep in every, every day, but I, I have the ability to sleep in on Saturday and Sunday. And, um, and so uh, the, the church is like, no, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and get to it. And so I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and, uh, and, and just want to extend a welcome to you, uh, for those of you who I don't know, haven't had a chance to meet yet. And so, um, we're, we're in a new series, uh, that we've entitled He Is. And so essentially what we're looking at over the next few weeks together, um, is the character of God. Uh, we kind of, kind of rooted this series around a quote by a guy named A.W. Tozer. He was a, a theologian and a pastor. And so we'll throw the quote up on the screen so you can see it. Um, this is what Tozer said. I read this in college and, and kind of shifted and changed it a lot uh, of kind of what I just thought about um, myself and, and the Lord. But this is, this is what Tozer says. Um, this comes from a book called Knowledge of the Holy. Uh, he says this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me read it again because I want it to land. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so l- last week we kind of looked at this idea, right, that, um, that, that Tozer is putting forward and that Scripture obviously uh, has been saying since the beginning that the most important thing about you, right, is not your ethnicity, it's not your sexual orientation, it's not your occupation, it's not your, um, your, your skill set, it, it, it's, it's none of these things. These things aren't the most important thing about you. The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. Because what you think about God shapes and influences everything else about you. Does it not? It shapes and influences everything about you. And so last week, we, we um, really just kind of uh, came around this idea that we, ha- we have a God, who is, um, a God who is personal, a God who is coming close to um, his people, a God who wants to be known by a people. This is, um, this is who God is. And so this week, uh, we're going to be kind of gathering around um, uh, the first part of this. But, but I want to, uh, I kind of want to start our time. So uh, C.S. Lewis was a Christian apologist. Uh, he was an atheist before he became uh, an apologist. So he wrote the movies Chronicles of Narnia. He didn't write the movies. That was a joke. Uh, he wrote Chronicles of Narnia, right? He directed Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis. And so, um, so C.S. Lewis was uh, an apologist. He was uh, incredible, had a radio, um, radio ministry. You know what I mean? This is what he did, right? So um, he wrote a couple of different books, and so if you're familiar at all with the, the kind of Narnia series, uh, one of the books is called Prince Caspian. And so all of these things, uh, these books are so wonderful because you're reading them, and C.S. Lewis is like, uh, you know, it, it, when you're reading Narnia, he's, Lewis is like, I don't know if you're a Christian, but I'm going to infiltrate you. You know what I mean? It's like this like subtle, like, oh, I really like that Aslan character. And C.S. Lewis is like, he's God! You know, he like has, he's like surprised, you know, and you're like, well, I guess I like God. You know, I like Aslan. So, okay, so in Prince Caspian, I gotta move along because we're running late. You guys like to talk way too much. All right, so, so Prince Caspian, it's okay. We don't have to go anywhere. Prince Caspian, um, Aslan and a character named Lucy had this really wonderful relationship. Lucy is the youngest of the sibling group um, that, that is getting to know uh, this, this becoming with, with Aslan. And so if you, in Prince Caspian, um, Aslan has been gone. This kind of God character has been gone. And uh, Lucy comes upon Aslan. Um, and listen to, this, listen to this interaction. She finds him uh, again, and this is what she says. She says, um, Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy, uh, sobbed Lucy at last. And then Lewis says, the great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell, half standing and half lying between his, paw, his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her, and she gazed up into the large, wise face. Now listen to what C.S. Lewis writes here. This is beautiful. This is where our our series is going. This is where it's going to land. It says, his warm breath came all around her. She gazed up into his large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, 
you're bigger. He responds, that is because you are older, little one, he answered. Not because you are bigger. And then this is what he says. He says, I am not. He says, but every year you grow, you find me bigger. Every year you grow, you find me bigger. Think, think about it this way. Do um, you, you know when like you're a kid and everything seems a lot larger? You know, like your, your hometown was larger, your, your bedroom was larger, like just everything. Your kind of old stomping grounds were larger, your tree house was larger, like everything was larger, you know? And, and now you, you kind of go back because our parents like to see us again. And so we go back to, our, you know, and, and what happens when you get back to your hometown, you're like, oh man, this place is actually uh, a, a lot a lot smaller than I imagined. Like it's not nearly as my room isn't as big, my tree house isn't as big, my kind of old kind of stomping grounds isn't as big, right? What, what, what's happened? Has your, your childhood kind of hometown and memories, have these things gotten smaller? N no, uh, they haven't gotten smaller. Uh, you've just gotten larger, right? And as you've gotten larger and, and as you've kind of grown up, all those things seem smaller, do they not? They're not nearly as large. Well, this is what makes Aslan so unique, is that Lucy sees Aslan and she hasn't seen him in a long time. And Aslan is actually larger than Lucy imagined. And it's not because Aslan has gotten larger, it's because as Lucy, hear it, as Lucy has grown in age, her perception of Aslan has gotten uh, more clear. This is what Lewis is saying. And so as we, this is Christian discipleship, this is Christian maturity, that as we grow older, we don't find God smaller, we find him larger. We find him more dynamic, more attractive, more engaging, more passionate. Like as we grow and mature in our faith, as we're seeing more and more of him, we're actually going, wow, God's a lot, God's a lot larger than I thought he was when I first began to follow him. This is what Lewis is saying. And, and this is kind of, this is the hope in the midst of this kind of series of looking at the characteristics of God is this idea that I think that as, as we grow mature, as we look over the next few weeks at his character, that you'll find him larger. You'll find him better, better than you thought he was. Okay, so let's look at the text. So in Exodus 34, 5 and 7, you, we heard um, Hannah read it, but um, let's look at this. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Exodus 34, or it'll also be on the screen as well. But verse 5 and 7, it says this. It says, The Lord came down in a cloud, uh, and he stood with him there. He's with Moses, and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. We looked at um, this text in detail last week. You can go back and listen if you missed it. Uh, verse 6, it says, The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed the Lord. And then here's the characteristics we're looking at this morning. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. He's slow to anger. So we're looking at the compassion of God, the, the, the gracious nature of God, and the fact that he's slow to become angry. Those are the kind of the three characteristics um, that, we're, uh, that we're going to look at. Now, here's what we know about um, in the ancient kind of Middle East. This is what we know about their relationship with the gods, the, the audience that this would have been coming to in this period. This is just kind of what we see from uh, literature. This is kind of what we understand. We, we understand that the divine, this idea of, of there's something greater than me played a pretty significant role. Uh, role in their life, right? Think back to your literature class in high school. What are you reading? The Iliad, the Odyssey, right? The, the Battle of Troy, Brad Pitt, <laughs> right? Think, think about, if you're thinking back on these kind of literary works, right? We're kind of reading it. And it's, you know, it's just these kind of epic tales that we're reading about. They're really engaging and, and, and you're kind of into it. What, what do you quickly recognize as you begin to kind of read this Middle Eastern literature? What do you recognize? That they had a, they were very tapped into the reality that there was a supernatural layer to their life, right? They're, they're, they're like, you see it you, all through it. There's this type of God, this type of little G God, what we'd say, this type of um, kind of deity that's going on, that's happening uh, in, in all of their interactions with people. We, we know based on, on what we have in scripture uh, and then based on what we even see in, in things outside of scripture, that there was this recognition of God. Here's the second thing that we know. The second thing that we know is that their relationship 
with the gods was based in what? It was based in fear. It, it, was, it was based in uh, essentially fear and appeasement, right? So the, the goal was, if you were living in this day, the goal was what? To keep the, the, to keep the gods kind of off, off your back, to keep them appeased, to give them sacrifices, to, right? I mean, this is what you did. So whatever particular, if it was, you know, God of rain, of earth, of sky, of sun, what, kind of whatever your particular interaction and fertility, all, all of these things, right? Whatever your God was, the idea was, I need to do a certain amount of things. I need to live a certain amount of way to appease the gods, to keep them happy. And so we know, hear this, we know that their relationship was defined by fear and appeasement. This is what they were seeking to do. This is how they lived. Now, Exodus 34, God shows up on the scene. Yahweh, is what the, the Hebrew translation is, Yahweh, Show, shows up on the scene and he comes to a people, the Israelites, and he says to them, I wanna be your God and you be my people. Let's, he, he had a DTR, you know? He defined the relationship for him. He says, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And, and look at, look back at the text. The, the first thing that he says to them is what? He's going to reveal himself here in Exodus 34. We see that this scripture is used over and over again in the Old Testament as the primary text in the Old Testament to reveal who God is. And the first thing here, think about their, their background relationship uh, with, the, with the divine. The first thing that he says to them is, I'm a God who's compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. I mean, can, can you imagine that for a moment as these people receiving this and, and hearing this? Oh, we have a God who's compassionate, he's gracious, and he's slow to anger? This, this was something that was, for them was like, whew, like was mind-blowing for them, right? We, we kind of hear this because we've read it a lot. If you've grown up in church, you kind of read like, yeah, yeah, of course, he's, you know, he's something. And they're like, no, no, this was, this was marking for them. Okay, a couple of things here. Um, I want to, uh, a couple of things concerning the fact that God's compassionate, gracious in nature and has a capacity to slow down. Here, here's number one. Here's kind of first thought. Um, if you're taking this, you can write it down or whatever. Um, God's compassion and grace, God's compassion and grace is his central disposition. God's compassion and grace is his central disposition. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, is God wrathful? Yes. A absolutely, he's wrathful. He's wrathful. We'll, we'll see this kind of further down. We'll see this in um, other weeks. Does God pursue justice? Yes, absolutely. He will go after justice. Does he punish those who do evil? Yes, that is 100% a fact. God will go after those who live, um, who live evil uh, lives. He will go after those who take advantage of the marginalized. He will go after those who sexually abuse other people. He will go after those who treat people less than human. God will go after them. He will. We, we see it. We see it in scripture. Like he'll do it. I, I don't want to. I, wanna, I want you to hear this. I don't want to downplay that part about God. I, I don't, I, I'm very much don't want to downplay that part. It's, it's a very real thing that God will enact justice at the end of the day. At the end, he'll enact justice. It's just that his wrath it, is not his central disposition. His central disposition is compassion and grace and slow to anger. Right? Because I, I, I do want you to hear this. Because some of, for some of you, your, your views of God is that he's primarily a wrathful God. That, that, right? That your views of God is that he's um, a, a God who's kind of like roaming the earth looking to destroy people. Right? He's like looking for people to be out of line. That, that's kind of your view. Maybe that's your, your spiritual background. Maybe that's your church background. Is like that, that was kind of your view of God, that he, he's going to kind of roam around. He's just looking for it. Maybe, um, uh, have you ever done this before where you're like, you really want something and you know that, that prayer plays an important part, right? So maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's like a financial thing, maybe it's, it's something, you know, um, whatever it is for you. Maybe you've had it, right? You're like, I want the train to show up on time. All right, so have you ever done this before? Or maybe this is just me. I used to have this perception of God where I was like, I really want that. 
if I verbalize that to God, he'll take it from me. Have you ever thought that before in your prayer life? Where you're like, if I verbalize to God that I want this particular thing, he will see that and he will recognize that thing. That I, he, will, he will think, Brian loves that too much. I'm not going to give him that. Have you, has anyone else ever thought that before? You're like, if I pray this, but it's because our, our view of God is so jacked up. We're like, if I pray this, he may take it from me. So I'm just not even going to verbalize it. This is how messed up we are in our view of God. Not like, man, he's compassionate and, and gracious and he wants to bless you. It's that he's going to keep something from you, right? He's, he's all about your growth and your spiritual um, growth in, uh, in reality. And so, so we, need to, we need to come around this idea that his grace and his compassion is his central disposition. Uh, listen to the way that um, listen to the way that Dan Ortland captures this thought beautifully in um, his book. He says this. He says, God is unswervingly just, but what is his disposition? What's his disposition? What is he on the edge of his seat eager to do? If you catch me off guard, what will leap out of me before I have time to regain my composure will likely be the grouchiness. If you catch God off guard, this is beautiful. He says, if you catch God off guard, what leaps out most freely is blessing. The, the impulse to do good, the desire to swallow us up in joy. This is his disposition. This is the primary kind of landing spot um, where, where the Father goes. Listen, God wants you primarily to see him as a God who in his presence brings joy. This is what he wanted for the Israelites. This is what he wants for you. He's a, he's a father who brings joy. So his goodness and his compassion are, are, central to, um, his, are, are central to his disposition. It's really his, God's, there's a reason we call him father. It's his parental love that draws him into relationship with us. These two Hebrew words, we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but these Hebrew words, compassion and grace, uh, essentially the Hebrew word for compassion is a, a feeling word. It's this deep kind of parental feeling word. So this is the word that, um, do you remember when the two moms came before a King Solomon and they were arguing over the baby? And King Solomon, because he's a f genius, he's like, what we'll do is we'll cut the baby in half. You get one, you get the other. Do you know the situation, right? Um, I saw it on a cartoon back in the day. And so... Um, you know that situation, and, and then what, what happens, right? The moms are like, yeah, let's cut the baby up. I'll no, 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 that's not what happens, right? No, who, who steps up and goes, don't do that. Let her have the baby. And the Hebrew word, it says that she felt a love for that child in that moment. The, the Hebrew word for love in that moment is the same word for compassion in Exodus 34 for God. It's a parental love. Now, grace, grace is the action word. So grace is what, what causes God to... Um, is the action word of, of going. So the compassion is a feeling and, and the grace is what, what's going to help you, right? This is what you do is a, this parental love. It's like uh, at, my son woke up at 5 a.m. this morning. Um, this is the gift that our kids. And so he woke up at 5 a.m. and he was knocking on the door. We lock him in so he can't get out. And so don't, you can tell me about it later. So, um, so he was knocking on the door. And so I, you know, I have to go wake him up. I have to go open the door because if he keeps jamming on the door, all of our neighbors will think we have a robber. And so I go, uh, and I love him. And so I go, I open the door. I'm like, hey, buddy, what's up? It's 5 a.m. I'm a little drowsy. You know what I mean? Actually, I'd just been up praying and fasting at 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, so he interrupted my fast time. Um, so I roll in there, and I'm like, dude, what is up, right? What do you need? And he goes, uh, he goes TV. I'm like, no, nah, you're not getting the TV. What else? And he's like, well, I'm hungry. I'm like, all right, I will, I'm like, I'll bring you some saltine crackers and some milk, right? So I'm like, get back in bed before I destroy you. Get back in bed and I will bring these to you, right? And so, so that's, what, that's what I did. I got crackers and milk. I'm like, oh, drowsy, you know, drowsy. I'm like, here, and, and I, what, why do I do that? Because I'm moved by my like parental love because I, ca I care about my boy and I lock the door and I go back to bed. Do you know what I mean? All right. So this is, this is, this is the idea that, that, that God is seeking to, um, this idea that, that, that God's seeking to care, uh, see here. Now, don't we see this? Don't we see this in the New Testament? Isn't this what Jesus is doing all the time? 
is he's seeking to put forward this idea that God is a compassionate and gracious God. Like if you, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, right, all, all he's seeking to do is to show the nature of the Father. This is what Jesus is always doing. I mean, there's definitely moments, right, where Jesus is gonna respond in anger. If you're reading the Gospels, there's a couple places where he's responding in anger. I mean, there's one section where it says he's like, he's slowly braiding a whip, right? That's like scary intention type stuff situation. You know what I mean? Like you, you see like compassionate and loving Jesus, he's sitting there and he's braiding, he's braiding a whip. I mean, that's, that's scary Jesus, you know? But for the majority of Jesus's, I don't want to downplay that, but the majority of Jesus' ministry, he's doing what? He's seeking to show that the Father is full of compassion and grace. I mean, all throughout, all throughout Jesus' ministry, it's full of moments of him uh, exhibiting compassion and grace to the level that it's bewildering to his followers. Doesn't Jesus do that? Where they're like, we don't have time to do that. What are you doing? There's no, there's no merit in doing that. I mean, Jesus, all throughout his ministry, is going to who? He's going to the, the, the marginalized, those who are on the fringes of society. He, he's, he's, this is what he's doing. He's, taking, he's going to marginalize women, and he's empowering them. He, he's saying, no, no, you're great in the kingdom. Follow me. I'll make, you, I'll make you followers. I'll make you fishers of men. And women. like, come with me. This is what he's doing. He's going to the, the lame and those who can't see. And he's saying, no, come with me. I'm going to heal you. Come with me. This is, this is what he's doing. He's showing compassion and grace to the ones in this society. And I would even say in, in our day. He's showing compassion and grace to the ones who are least likely to get it, but are in the most need of it. And this is what Jesus was doing all throughout his ministry. He's seeking to, to image this, um, this idea of God as a um, compassionate and uh, loving uh, father. This is, this is what we see. You know, sometimes we think, um, sometimes we think the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are different. But, but Jesus, in reality, Jesus isn't putting forward a new thing. He's just putting a flesh and blood, blood, a flesh and blood reality to the Old Testament God that they understood. B.B. Warfield says it this way. He's a professor at Princeton. Um, was a professor at Princeton. He says this: the, the emotion which we should naturally expect to find most frequently attributed to Jesus, whose whole life was a mission of mercy. This is what Jesus was doing, a mission of mercy, and whose ministry was so marked by deeds of benevolence that it was summed up in the memory of his followers as going through the land doing good is no doubt compassion. So that's how you would sum up the, the ministry of Jesus would be this idea of compassion. Okay, so his grace and his mercy are central to his disposition. Second thought here, and this is, uh, this is landing in this idea of slow to anger, is that God being slow to anger, hear this, God being slow to anger is more attributed to his ability than it is your worth. And this is really good news. God's ability to be slow to anger is more uh, attributed to, right? Or his, his, him being able to be slow to anger is more attributed to his ability than your worth. Now, what, what do I... Um, mean by that? Because I don't think we, we tend to think about the fact that God being slow to anger is a part of his character. I mean, that's, if you're listing off a, char- a, a characteristics of God, you're probably not going, oh, he's slow to anger. I love that one. But, but this, is what, this is what God is saying here to the Israelites in Exodus 34. He's actually saying, no, this is, this, is a, a, a part of, um, this is a part of who I am. Th- think about it this way. Um, think about someone who you would characterize as someone being slow to anger. Do you, you have that person in your mind? Someone slow to anger. And you would say, what about them? You would say, man, they're a really controlled individual. Or, or maybe let's flip that. Maybe, maybe think about it this way. Think about, someone, um, think about someone who's quick to anger, like flies off the handle quickly. What, what's the number one? You'd say what? You'd say that person is what? An uncontrolled person. Someone who is, is dangerous. Someone who you don't want to get in close proximity to. And, and so God is saying in Exodus 34, he's actually saying, no, this is part of who I am. Like I'm, I'm actually um, slow to anger. I'm a controlled God. 
I, I, I'm, I have the ability to do this. Okay, so two thoughts here. Um, two thoughts when it comes to this idea of, uh, or implications that connect with the fact that it's not about our worth, but about his ability. Um, here's the first thing. Uh, it separates us from God. The fact that God is slow to anger separates us from God. It, it puts us, um, or maybe say it this way, it makes us, uh, it makes the difference between God and humanity uh, apparent. That, that he's different than us, right? Right, he, here we're saying that God is slow to become angry. Like, you, think about that. You have to provoke God to anger, don't you? You have to provoke God to anger. The writer of Hebrews, you know what the writer of Hebrews says about us as people? He says, hey, as a community of God's people, you need to figure out how to provoke one another to what? To love and care for one another. The writer, he was like, provoke um, one another to love and care for one another. Provoke each other to love. Do you know what the writer of Hebrews doesn't have to say to us? Hey, uh, can you provoke one another to anger? Do you know why he doesn't say that? Because it just comes natural, baby. You know what I mean? Like, it's just this part of us where we're like, like, just look around culturally. Let's just take the culture that we are currently in, 2021. What, if you were going to define it, you would define it as what? Man, there's a lot of angry people. Now, justified and unjustified. Like, we live in the red. This is who we are. And, and so, the, the, the scriptures here, he's like, no, I'm, I'm a God who's actually, you have to, you have to provoke me to anger. Because I'm slow to anger. It, it takes time. I mean, this, this separates us. Jen Wilkins says it this way. Um, it's so funny. Uh, she says, we allow the most trifling annoyance to test our patience. The way someone chews a dirty dish left on the counter. The forgotten, you're all like my roommate. The forgotten turn signal, my spouse. Um, these minor, listen to this. She says this. Um, these minor perceived grievances invite our anger to rise. All these things are rising. But God, there it is, right? That's a preposition, but we love that one. He said, she says, but God, against who we've committed and continue to commit actual sins, both small and great, bears with us patiently in the full knowledge of every single one of our offenses. God sees every one of your offenses and yet at the same time is still slow to become angry with you. It's incredible news, unbelievable um, news. Second thing is that this idea that it's his ability and not our worth, it means that, this is so crucial, it means that you and I can sit securely in our relationship with God. It means that we can sit securely in a relationship with God. Now, why is that? Um, if God's character, like if, if, um, God's, if God's like proclivity to become angry is based not on his ability, but on your actions, he's probably what? Angry all the time, <laughs> right? Like if that's the kind of God that we had, he'd be angry all the time. Because I don't know if you're like me, but I got, I got continually got stuff going on, right? Imperfections, like just going on. But it's actually him becoming slow to anger is more about his ability to be slow to angry than your worth to keep up your end of the deal. That's good news, man. It's great news that, that, he, can, that he can pull this off. One, one Puritan pastor, uh, Stephen Carnock says this. He says, uh, men that are great in the world so men that are great in the world are quick in passion and are not so ready to forgive an injury or bear with an offender. It is a want of power over that man's self that makes him do unbecoming things. So he says, uh, men that are great in the world, it's a, for a want of power. So when they do unbearable things, it's because they don't have the, the power of restraint. This is what he's saying here. They don't have the power of restraint. And he says, a prince that can bridle his passions is a king over himself as well as over his subjects. And he says this, God is slow to anger because he is great in power. God is slow to anger because he is great in power. He has no less power over himself than over his creatures. So God in his ability, hear it. So God in his ability 
has not only power over you and I, but has power over himself. It's rooted in his um, ability. This is what he um, has to do. Okay, so last section here. Let's think about this for a second. You guys are doing great. Let's hang in there for a second. Here's what I've entitled this last part. Because uh, I, I, I do want you to hear it. This is how I've entitled this last little section. Uh, I've entitled it, Our um, Conflicted Relationship with God's Compassion uh, with God's Compassion and Patience. Our Conflicted Relationship with God's Compassion and Patience. Here's why I've entitled this. Um, when we think about God's compassion, grace, and slow to anger, um, it really depends on your where you're at on this spectrum or where you're at, uh, what position you are on this spectrum, whether you love or hate the fact that we have a God who's compassionate and slow to become angry. It depends on your perspective, whether you love or hate the fact that God is compassionate and he's slow to anger. Now, what, what do I mean um, by that? Well, we have a whole story in the Old Testament, two quick stories, Old Testament and New Testament. We have a whole story in the Old Testament about a guy who becomes frustrated with the fact and actually disobedient with the fact that God is what? That he's compassionate and slow to become angry. We have a whole, whole story in, in the Old Testament. Have you heard of the book of Jonah? Now, I don't want to get into the whole book of Jonah. Let me just kind of summarize, right? Um, so if you've been around church, you're probably familiar with it, or you've seen the veggie tales, whatever. So uh, I, don't get hung up on the big fish part. Like, we can talk about that later if you want. We can chop it up. But let's just hang in there for a second. So, so Jonah is instructed by God to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was part of the Assyrian Empire. These were nasty, nasty dudes. And so God comes to Jonah and says, hey, bro, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to tell them that I see their wickedness. I see their rebellion and I am coming for them. Like, I want you to go to them and communicate to them that I'm a God in heaven who sees their wickedness. They're going to pay for it if they do not turn. And so Jonah, a prophet, does what? He jumps in the boat, goes straight to Nineveh. It's a beautiful story. No, the text says that, that Jonah hears from God and he goes the other direction. So if Nineveh's here, he, he actually, it, it goes the opposite direction. He, he's like, no, I'm getting out of here as if God doesn't see him. And says he's creating problems for people along the way because listen, this is not, this is free this morning. He's creating for problems for everyone that he's interacting because people that live in rebellion against God create problems wherever they go, right? In their social circles. So he's creating problems. They throw him off the boat. And a fish swallows this brother. You know what I mean? Like Cape Cod style. Dude, that's all about well recently. All right, so um, swallows him, and he decides I've done something majorly wrong, right? This is what a belly of a well situation will do to you. And so the, the, he, he's like, God, I'll, I'll, I'll go do it. So he, he goes, um, he preaches to uh, Nineveh, and um, it's this incredible uh, this incredible thing. Uh, and so this, this is Jonah chapter three, verse 10. It says this, God saw their actions. So they're, they're, they're turning. It says, God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. And so God relented from the disaster that he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. So God stopped. He was going to threaten them and he didn't do it. All right. Look at our boy, Jonah, Jonah four, chapter four, starting in verse one. Look at our guy, Jonah. It says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He became furious. And he prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled towards Tarshish um, in, in the first place. Okay, so look what he, look what he does here. I, I love this. He says, I knew, I knew that you were gracious and a compassionate God slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents in sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah actually quotes, actually quotes Exodus 34 to God as a reason for why he's displeased with God. See, Jonah wasn't running from uh, the Assyrian Empire. He wasn't running from Nineveh. He was running from Yahweh. See, we want to determine the time and place where God should show compassion and grace. And we want to turn, determine the audience at which he should direct his compassion and grace. Do we not? 
Maybe you've been hurt in, in your past. Parental, relate, whatever it is, whatever it is, right? It's a legitimate hurt, legitimate hurt. Hurt that has to do work. Or, or maybe you, you've been hurt at your workplace or at school or, or whatever, whatever this kind of situation is. And, and in that hurt that you, you've received, you've developed this posture of, of being one who wants to determine um, who God should love and who God shouldn't love. Who he should extend compassion to and who he shouldn't send compassion to. Maybe you were, maybe you're here, maybe you were the one who was the abuser, right? Emotionally, spiritual, whatever. You were the one who was unkind. You right, and, and now you're trying to sit in this idea that you have a God in heaven who loves you. And so Jonah, or God, Jonah, prophet from God, runs because he's determined that Nineveh is not worth the love of God. I mean, wasn't this his moment? Like, wasn't this Jonah's opportunity to have a front row seat to seeing God transform a community? To seeing God save men, women, and children in Nineveh? Like, this was Jonah's opportunity to sit on the front row and see God do something remarkable, and he couldn't get past the fact that he was serving a God whose central disposition was compassion, grace, and being slow to anger. He quotes it to him. Jesus, um, Jesus, in one of his most popular parables, uh, he tells a story of two uh, rebellious sons. It's called the, uh, we typically call it the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, but it's actually two sons. And here's what we know about the story, and I'm finishing up. Here's what we know. We know that the younger son uh, came to the father and said, uh, I would like my inheritance now. Thank you very much. Basically, it's like, I wish you were dead. Can I go ahead and get my inheritance, right? I'm gonna go ahead and get that. Give it to me in Bitcoin. Do you know what I'm saying? Give me my inheritance and I'm gonna go do whatever. So the, the father, incredibly in this story, the father gives him the inheritance that was coming to him. He's like, okay, uh, like you can have it. He, he's, he, he does it. And so the story goes, Jesus tells the story that the son goes and does what? He invests it, you know, he gets some, gets some mortgage. In it. No, no, he goes, he squanders it. He's doing all, all kinds of just shady stuff. You know what I mean? He's, he's on prostitutes and, and on food and, and whatever. He's just, he's flying through this thing. It's shocking. Until he gets to the point where he's, he's now working because he needs the money. And it says that he's, he's um, in this situation where he's like in a farm and he's working for someone. And he begins, he's so hungry and so poor that he begins to what? He begins to wish that he had the, the food that the pigs have, which for a Hebrew man or woman is like the bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel. This is where he's gotten to in his life. And he thinks, I'll go back to the father and I'll just tell the father I'll work for him. Like just, I'll be a worker in your house. Just let me, it's gotta be better than this. It's gotta be better than this. So Jesus is telling this story. And, and here's, here's where it picks up. This is Luke 15. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. Luke 15, uh, verse 20. So he's going to his father. This is what it says. So he got up. He went to his father. But while, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with anger. Right? Was filled. The, 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 the son was really far off and the, the father was filled with bitterness. No. Remember, Jesus is saying, this is what our father in heaven is like. This is what the kingdom's like. And he says, the father saw the son a, far, a, a long way off, and he was what? He was filled with compassion. He was filled with parental compassion. It says he ran. He threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him. He said, the son, uh, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Uh, verse 22, this is beautiful. But the father told his servants, quick, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger, sandals. He just is just decking this, decking him out, man. He said, "You're welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're you're here. You're home." Doesn't I? I know all this stuff. You're you're home. He he says, uh, "This son who was gone is now alive again. He was lost and now he's found. Let's celebrate." And so Jesus telling this parable says that the older son who's there at the house, he hears the celebration. He's like, what's going on? Is it, it's my opportunity. You know, they're finally going to recognize me. So he finds a servant. He's like, hey, dude, what is happening? Why are they, what's the party going on? They're slaughtering the best Me? He's like, dude, this must be, you know, whatever. This is fantastic. And the servant says, your brothers come home. Your brothers come home. 
and the, the son um, responds with a tremendous amount of anger and bitterness towards the father. And he's like, man, I've, I've been here this whole time. I've been, I've been doing this for you. I've been working for you. And you freely and lavishly are doling out compassion and grace to this younger brother of yours that squandered everything. Like, this is the type of father you are. This is who you are. This is what you're about. Luke 15, 31 and 32, it says this, the son, he said, son, he said to him, this is the father. He said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. So here's what the father said. The father, even with the older son, is imploring him to come back home. I mean, think about how quickly and how justified the father would have been to respond in anger to both of these sons. To the rebel, openly rebellious son, he could have responded in anger. And to the older son, the self-righteous son, he could have responded in anger. But he does what? He offers compassion and grace to both of them. And seeks what? Seeks reconciliation with both of them. This is the father that we have. This is, this is who we are. This is what Jesus is seeking to communicate to us. This is why Jesus says, um, uh, this is why Jesus says, mimic my life live in the way of Jesus. This is who I am. I'm, I'm a picture of the compassionate and graceful father. Do that. Like live, live in, in my way. Be someone who is uh, slow to become angry. See, here's the idea. Here's the thought. I'll close up. We cannot be a people. We cannot be a people that sit back and rejoice in the compassion and grace of our father, that rejoice in the fact that we have a God in heaven who's slow to become angry and not ourselves be a people who are full of compassion, grace, and are slow to respond in anger. We can't be. It, it influences the, the way that we live. The, all throughout the New Testament, um, the biblical writers are saying what? That we're to be a community, our church, Grace City, is to be a community of people full of compassion and grace towards others. That we're to become slow, slow to angry among one another. This is who we are, right? I mean, the, the clearer you see God, the clearer you see yourself. The, the older you get, right, the bigger you see Him, the better perception you have of yourself. A couple of questions I'm gonna pray uh, for you this morning. Um, who have you withheld compassion and grace from? Who, who have you said, man, not that one, not that person? Who, who have you determined, um, who have you determined now, it, Compassion and grace shouldn't be extended to them. I'm not going to extend it to them, and God shouldn't extend it to them. And, and you've kind of kept them kind of, kind of far back. Who, who have you, maybe I say it this way, who have you been treating as your enemy? Now, you wouldn't explicitly say, Bob's my enemy. You know, that would, you'd be an awful person. And who says that anyways? Because we're not in war. So, so you, wouldn't, you wouldn't explicitly say it, but your actions would imply it. You keep them at a distance. Right, you just determine like, nah, I don't wanna, you're like, you're pulling a, a Jonah on him, you know? Maybe God's been calling you to share the way of Jesus, to speak truth to them, to show that God's a, a God who wants to be in close. And who are, you, who are you not doing that with? At your work, in your, your classmates? Or wherever, wherever you find yourself, who are you not doing that with? You're seeking to say that. Where, where and who, maybe you're here and, and You've been responding in anger too quickly. Who have you been doing that to? How do you, how do you look more like Jesus? And this is true of myself. I'm not reading this, I'm like, ah, shoot. Where am I doing that, Lord? Where am I doing that? Show it to me. Help me, help me do that better.